It's Mog here for the Egyptian Magic Podcast, and today I'm talking to Caroline Wise. Uh, and as usual, I, my first question is, in effect, who are you? Or just tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself. And I know you've been on the magical scene and the publishing scene for an, a lot longer than I have, which is it. So, <laughs> so uh, but so, so you've got a lot. <clears throat> you could potentially go on for quite a long time. You know, and say, t tell us about yourself. But go on, tell us what <laughs> you like to tell about yourself. Tell us who you are and uh, what where you're coming from. Okay. Um, my main interests uh, these days are working with the goddesses, um, going back to their most primal forms before you know before we cloaked them as these sort of human forms we know today um and i but i started out um with pagan sensibilities from childhood uh through nature and the garden and all the creatures in it and and flowers uh very strong feelings of nature mysticism since childhood which has always been there um and books uh, books like the Narnia stories and Pucker Pooks Hill when I was a child just put me into magical realms and magical realms were quite natural to me and my sister and I had a lot of paranormal experiences, poltergeist experiences, apports um, and this was natural because we didn't know it wasn't. Um, so I gravitated towards um, all of the esoteric really, um, in a huge broad spectrum uh, spectrum of it um so in the early 80s um i was a founder member of asap for instance the association for the scientific study of anomalous phenomena <laughs> Try saying that when you're drunk um which was like an offshoot of the society for uh, psychical research um but a deep interest in folklore and very involved already by then with the earth mysteries with looking at um the unique properties of ancient sacred sites um, and their context within the wider landscape. So I was already quite involved with, with the Lay Hunter journal um, by that time. It was um, at the inaugural meeting of ASAP in 1982. We went back to somebody's house, an acquaintance's house, and for reasons I never know, because he's dead now, he handed me a book and he said, I think this one is for you. And I opened the book and two hours later, uh, I mean, it seemed quite rude. I was, I went down into this incredible well in this book that was magical writing and ideas that completely docked with my own synapses. And I think we all find that, we all find what works for us and none of them are better than the other. Any system works, um, it's just whether it works for you. And so that- What was the book? What was oh, the yeah, book? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, that book was Outside the Circles of Time. All Kenneth. right, okay, yeah, yeah. And that was, um, I went inside Ken the book, and book the book went inside me. Uh, and by, always by a string of synchronicities, um, I ended up, I was working for Psychic News later, uh, and I, by weird coincidences I won't go into now, um, I ended up in a bookshop near the British Museum called Scoob 2, uh, just as they were taking out of a box that they got at auction, a load of old Freemason books, in the bottom was the original Carfax monographs, and they didn't know what they were. Wow. And I was just there as a customer, so I told them what they were, and they offered me a job. And the job was to build up the shop, which was just a general second-hand shop, um, to have a major esoteric theme, which I did. Um, but I also, they said, we want you to start publishing, we want to publish an esoteric line. Um, and so we initiated the republishing of Kenneth Grant's trilogies. Um, 
so where am I now? Um, again, by a string of synchronicities, um, I'm actually married to Michael Staley, who became Kenneth's publisher after I moved from Scoob um, to work for Psychic Press at Atlantis and then bought Atlantis business from them later. Uh, so Michael took over Kenneth Grant's publishing. I hope this isn't too long and rambling. And um, you're doing and good. here we are today. I'm sitting. This computer is sitting on a pile of uh, Kenneth Grant books to to raise. Right. It. <laughs> well, you know, I always kind of when I I think the first time I met you, which was probably introduced by a uh, Cheska mm -hmm. mutual friend, and uh, I I think it was you know really your your association was more then was with the psychic questing thing i think yes, very much we sat down in the pub or wherever it was a whole bunch of us and i think uh, i got to talk to you and uh, as i think you then said yeah you know i've been reading this really weird book but well, this really interesting book by kenneth grant and you, i guess you knew that that I was also interested in the in in the same material in the Typhonian and Kenneth Grant stuff at the time. So you said, "Yeah, this is really, this is really changing my life." So I can re almost remember that moment. So you say you're now right. You can together with uh, mixed alias stuff I publishing, and uh, I think I'm right in saying you know I get these words right. The Typhonian order now. Yeah. Are you actually kind of yourself uh, a, a member, or is that appropriate to say of the type? Well, of I, mean, I couldn't possibly comment, could I? <laughs> so it's all right if I ask you the question. I had this before, right? I'm allowed to ask certain questions, but it doesn't mean guarantee that anybody's going to answer it. Okay, but you're widely associated, I go, I guess, with Mick, uh, with the Typhonian Order and uh, and the Kenneth Grant tradition of. Uh, an interpretation, I suppose you say, of the of the Crowley mythos, perhaps even the extension. So, do you want to say a little bit about that about Crowley then, uh, or I mean, how do you, what do you think about Alistair Crowley? As the we're doing this as a kind of preview of the forthcoming Thelemic Symposium. So I ask everybody the same questions. You know, you don't have to say. You don't have to just say anything good or bad. I mean, whatever you think, what's your kind of take on it now after all these years and quite a lot of inside knowledge about the kind of ins and outs of the Crowley uh, tradition? Uh, I think it's a fascinating phenomenon. Uh, the book of the law, that is, if you, you know, um, and Crowley himself um, trying to smash down those doors of uh, hypocrisy and stifling kind of... Uh, Christian society um, of his day uh, can only be championed, really. Uh, you know, we could go into, like, he wasn't a particularly nice man. Um, Everybody uh, says that. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, the, the whole way women are treated and, and his friends even. Um, but certainly world-changing um, for many, many people. And um, the world would be a poorer place if he hadn't existed, wouldn't it? Um, I I think the lemma is so much wider than Crowley. Um, certainly, with my work now, I don't really think about Crowley a lot. And I um, your your um, conference is a thelemic conference, um, so I'm also looking at again. This came through originally through paranormal experience, but I'm also work closely with the ritual dramas of Florence Farr. And if you read some of her words um, when she's talking about gods or she's talking about um, states of consciousness or whether she's poetically writing like she does in The Shrine of the Golden Hawk, for instance, um, you see vibrate, well, you hear vibrations of the Book of the Law three years before it, it was received. I mean, right. you know, this current, okay. this Thelemic current isn't Crowley's current. Crowley was, a, a you know, obviously a major proponent of it, but um, I'm more interested in looking around it as well. Okay, yeah, well, you probably were guessing. Uh, that was always the next question. As I say, it's the, the Thelemic Symposium, which is this 
kind of philosophy, I suppose you say, a philosophy of life, a kind of magical tradition. Some people see it as a political thing that Crowley was uh, a channel for or a kind of advocate of. Uh, and people quite like to make a distinction between respect for Crowley as the kind of person who'd, who brought this to people's attention, plus a lot of all, uh, awful lot of other magical traditions as well. Uh, it's almost difficult to think of anything that he didn't touch upon but in the end people kind of say you should take the him out of the equation as well and look at the philosophy so what i what what do you think about the thalamic philosophy of you know the do what they will she'll be the whole of the law and all this sort of stuff well first of all i don't think you you should take any active ingredient out of some a whole um you can't take crowley out of it um everyone can do as they will with crowley but um I just like personally to see a broader picture of the Lima and the philosophy um, that doesn't have to be through that lens. Um, but yeah, um, you know, in, and as far as the interpretation in the, is that you've, you are your own star in orbit and you have your path. And if you're on your right path, there's not going to be the obstacles there knocking you to the side to say, you know, you're on the wrong path. Um, I think it's a great philosophy. Okay. Well, we better move on to the the subject then, that you're, the thing that you present, because I know you do a lot of uh, presentations, lots of very, very interesting areas, including the one you just mentioned, the, the Florence Spa thing, which, you know, going to the recent conference, I was I, I thinking, quite a revelation really it's quite amazing uh the amount of material and the interest and importance of what you've done but tell us now about but for our conference the Islamic conference you're doing something kind of unusual i would have thought you're not actually talking about crowley or 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 kenneth grant you're talking about um steffi grant so can you tell us something about her and why she's of interest well, I'll tell you all about her at the conference. Yeah, don't um, give too much away, absolutely. An interesting life, <laughs> a fascinating life, um, an admirable life. Uh, but I, I'm always aware that whether we're talking about artists or great writers or great magicians, uh, male magicians, often um, the wife is just the wife, <laughs> uh, if you know what I mean. And I'm all for women's voices being heard and Steffi and Kenneth were a partnership she wasn't in second in command although she totally believed um in his work the, the work they would call it um and she was the driving force really I would say behind getting it published at all and she was a force to be reckoned with but she was also the most amazing artist and the paintings that appear as illustrations in the trilogies um, absolutely encapsulate um, that kind of primal stirring magic um, that Kenneth Grant focuses his philosophy through and um, I'll be looking at her as an artist, but I'll also be looking at um, the people they knew, uh, especially Steffi. Um, she would be the one that in the past would have gone out um, socializing maybe a bit more uh, because those people are remarkable. And it might also put to bed a few of the silly misunderstandings uh, about the grants and, and, and what they were about uh, as well, if, if people knew the people that they hang, hung out with. Um, and I think it would be good for people interested in the Lima and the characters in it um, to hear more about her. So Crowley always had this idea of a uh what would you call it, a scarlet woman, a kind of magical partner, maybe as in folk tantra, you'd say a shakti or whatever. So was, was Steffi Grant 
I, I guess it's an obvious thing. She was this partnership. You you mean that she was his magical partner? She was his Scarlet Woman. Would you say that? Uh, he they he saw it as Shakti. Yeah. And a completely equal and and um, yeah, completely equal, if not more important. So did she channel stuff for him and, and things like that? Was she a very operational magician or was her main contribution the kind of manifestation in terms of pictures and stuff? Because I know she illustrated the cover, the rather startling cover, I still think, of, of Liber ABA Magic and Theory and Practice. That's, I didn't ever notice this before, but uh, it, uh, I missed it anyway. That That's her work and that's shows us a you know, simple but it's very magical a, a, a piece of work more magical than any other cover they've done for it so w was that her mate that was her magic was uh was uh, not or um, did she do other stuff as well Well, her, her magic was in her being that's why how she is a shakti mm -hmm. to, to yeah. him um in everything about her i mean you know um they met as teenagers yeah in an art college and were together for about 70 years and the only time they were apart were towards the end of Kenneth's life when he had to spend some time in hospital um so they were a com they were a complete partnership but her her magic um generally operated through her art yeah. art is magic and that was magical art yeah makes sense really I mean, if you look at some of her pictures, I'm privileged enough to have seen... You've got, you've got all her pictures there with you? No, no, no. Um, but I have seen the originals, and they're alive. All right. Which you, you get with some magical artist. Right. So... And yeah. So, for the... For the the presentation you'll be you will be showing at samples of her work not yeah. actual ones but pictures and explaining them and telling the stories through her art really and they look fantastic on a big illuminated screen yeah okay i'm kind of quite looking forward to that as a taste i know you don't want to give too much away which is correct really come to the symposium and you know get the feast of uh, the visual feast that is uh, steffi grant's artwork so to finish off then, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about, without without promoting other events, but, you know, what what's the future for you? What's the next project? What are you going to do? Are you writing a book, another book about this or a book? Well, at the moment, I'm very, very uh, behind in <laughs> my next um series that i'm doing with the photographer ruth Byer uh, right. about london so we've done one on london ghosts right which was very good if i may say myself um where we were looking at ghosts not from are they true are they real is this a true story but places in london where people had reported hauntings or famous ghosts and we were trying to call out to the the figure of the ghosts themselves um with sort of compassion and not fear um, to hear their stories and to see maybe uh, uh, another side of why perhaps they would be haunting. And that's a great metrical exercise because it literally doesn't matter if it, the story is true or not. You're tuning into a, an area and getting all sorts of feedback. So it's just sort of like a ghostly carry on from psychic questing, I suppose. So what I have to do is my myth mythic London, my mystical London walks and talks um, need to be put down uh, in a photographic book. So that's one thing I'm doing next. Great project. Yeah. I always turned on to the idea of mystical London. I know a couple of people have had a go. And because of your inspiration, I did a kind of mystical, that collection of mystical Oxford, really. Oh, yeah. And apparently at the day after, if there's anybody survives this event uh, to the next day, uh, we're going to do a kind of magic in the museum in Oxford. Uh, just a short thing, really, in the Ashmolean, which is the okay. Magician's Museum. Let it be known. So, yeah, you kind of, I, I probably got a lot of the inspiration for that sort of stuff from Cheska, but also from you. So very much looking forward to the talk. Uh, just remains for me to say, um, well, thank you very much for coming. And uh, 
I always say, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, and love is the law, and love and the will. Thank you.